Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! The loss of 12 people's lives, civilians, uh, uh, is, is an issue of concern and uh, we, we would like to see that the civilian casualty uh, comes to the, to the minimum uh, uh, level. Civilian casualties mount as a major U.S. NATO offensive enters its fourth day. We'll go to Afghanistan to get the latest. Then Haiti, the politics of rebuilding. Government and in the conference rooms of foreign powers, the redesign of the country has already begun. What's the vision and who will benefit from the reconstruction? What kind of future is being planned for this nation of survivors? And busting the filibuster. Chicago attorney Thomas Gagan says end the filibuster and restore majority rule. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Taliban's top military commander has been reportedly captured in a secret joint operation by Pakistani and U.S. intelligence forces. Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar was seized last week in Karachi, Pakistan. He's currently in Pakistani custody, but is being interrogated by both Pakistani and U.S. officials. Baradar is considered to be the most significant Taliban figure to be detained since the U.S. led war in Afghanistan started more than eight years ago. He's believed to be the most trusted lieutenant of Mullah Muhammad Omar, the supreme leader of the Taliban. The New York Times broke the story last night. The Times had actually learned of Baradar's capture Thursday, but delayed reporting on it at the request of White House officials. The Taliban has denied the report, saying Baradar is still in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, the U.S. and NATO assault on the Afghan city of Marja has entered its fourth day. On Monday, troops faced sporadic resistance as they were targeted with gunfire, sniper fire and booby traps. The U.S. is coming under increasing criticism over the rise in civilian casualties during the operation. At least 19 civilians have been killed over the past three days in or around Marja. Another five civilians were killed Monday in an airstrike in neighboring Kandahar province. Nadir Nadiri of the Afghan Independent and Human Rights Commission urged international forces to protect civilians. Of 12 people's lives, civilians, uh, uh, is, is an issue of concern, and uh, we, we would like to see that the civilian casualty uh, comes to the, to the minimum uh, uh, level, uh, and uh, we also request that an investigation to be carried out uh, to see how uh, these civilians have, have, have lost their life. Nadir Nadiri has also called on the Taliban not to use civilians as human shields. Very much concerned, indeed, uh, about the fact that the Taliban has tried uh, uh, to prevent people leaving the conflict area, and uh, that shows that there was attempts to make human shields of civilians. And we strongly request uh, uh, um, the, the Taliban to uh, 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 prevent uh, uh, repeating such a such an act and avoid making human shields of the civilians. Officials in Dubai say arrest warrants will soon be issued for 11 Europeans suspected of assassinating a top Hamas commander. Mahmoud al Mabou was found dead last month in a hotel in Dubai. Police said the identified suspects include British, Irish, German and French passport holders, but there has been much speculation that the Israeli spy agency Mossad was behind the killing. A police statement said the killers had adopted to disguises, including wigs and hats, used an electronic device to enter Amabu's hotel room and lay in wait for him. Police in Dubai have not ruled out Israeli involvement in the killing. In Haiti, four children died Monday, and eight were seriously injured after heavy rains triggered mudslides that crashed into a classroom in the city of Cape Haitian. Meanwhile, Haitian President René Preval has estimated it'll take three years to clear the rubble left by last month's devastating earthquake. Preval told the Associated Press, Quote, it will take 1,000 trucks moving rubble for 1,000 days, so that's three years. And until we move out rubble, we cannot really build. On Monday, approximately 200 Haitians took to the streets of Port-au-Prince to protest the government's response to the earthquake. Jean-Ninac Joseph called on the Haitian government, church and civil society to take responsibility for the care of the local population. 
250,000 wounded Haitians is something extraordinary. We say and we say again that the state has to take responsibility. The church has to take responsibility. Civil society has to take responsibility. Federal safety regulators said Monday at least 34 people have died over the past 10 years due to sudden acceleration problems in Toyota vehicles. Another 22 reported injuries from unintended acceleration accidents involving Toyotas. Over the past four months, Toyota, uh, Toyota has recalled over 8.5 million vehicles globally. Clarence Ditlow of the Center for Auto Safety predicted the actual death toll is over 100. He said, quote, so many fatalities don't get attributed to a sudden acceleration, especially as you go further back in time before people were paying attention to Toyota. Reports are emerging from Honduras that critics of last summer's coup are still facing grave human rights abuses, even after the election of President Porfirio Lobo last month. According to the website World War IV Report, Julio Funes Benetes, a local leader of the anti-coup National Resistance Front, was shot dead Monday. On Friday, Hermes Reyes, a cultural worker with the Broad Movement for Dignity and Justice, was abducted by three presumed paramilitary gunmen and beaten and tortured before he was released hours later. Also on Friday, assailants broke into the home of Porfirio Ponce, a vice president of the Beverage Workers Union and a leader of the National Resistance Front. Also last week, two male and two female members of the civil resistance were kidnapped and held for three days. All four were beaten, and the women were raped. The captors reportedly said the assault was, quote, un saludo de Pepe, a greeting from Pepe, the nickname of President Lobo. President Obama is expected to announce today the federal government will give over $8 billion in loan guarantees to help build the nation's first new nuclear reactors in three decades. The loans will help the Atlanta-based Southern Company build two more nuclear reactors in Burke County, Georgia, near the city of Augusta. The loan guarantees will cover up to 70 percent of the company's portion of the project's costs. The Energy Policy Act of 2005 authorized the Department of Energy to issue up to $18.5 billion in loan guarantees for new nuclear plants and other energy projects. President Obama wants to triple the size of the loan guarantees to $54 billion. In Britain, police arrested 26 people Monday during a protest at a nuclear arms site where warheads for Trident submarines are made. Organizers said over 800 people took part in a blockade of the atomic weapons establishment in Aldermaston. Protesters included the Nobel Peace Prize winners Jody Williams and Mairead McGuire. The campaign for nuclear disarmament said the action was the biggest blockade of a nuclear arms site in Britain in many years. Hundreds of Iranian opposition supporters from across Europe demonstrated outside the United Nations headquarters in Geneva Monday, as Iran's human rights record was for the first time being examined by the Human Rights Council. Bita Tavana heads the Swiss Committee for a Free Iran. We just want a free nation, a democratic nation, and we want a secular country, and we think that this government is really a danger for the whole world, and we just want that the whole world is aware of that, and they, they stand, they, they, that they stand um, beside of the free-loving nation, freedom-loving nation of Iran. Inside the UN meeting, Iran's envoy to Geneva insisted Tehran fully respects human rights and denounced concerns raised by the United States, Britain, and France as political gestures amidst a wider nuclear standoff. In news from Egypt, opposition politician Ayman Noor said Monday he wanted to run for president again next year and would challenge a rule that bars him from entering the race. Noor is one of Egypt's best-known dissidents. In 2005, he challenged Hosni Mubarak for president, but came in a distant second. Soon after the vote, Noor was sentenced to five years in prison on charges of allegedly forging some of the signatures required to register his political party. Egyptian law bans Noor from any political office for at least five years after the end of his original jail term. In education news, The New York Daily News reports three politically connected charter schools are expected to receive over $72 million in city money to build new schools. The announcement comes just weeks after the city voted to close 19 public schools. Part of the $72 million in construction money will go to Pave Academy in Brooklyn. The school was founded by D. Spencer Robertson, the son of a billionaire hedge fund manager. Also receiving construction money will be the Harlem Promise Academy, founded by Jeffrey Canada 
a, a close ally of Mayor Mike Bloomberg. The third charter school receiving construction funds is Peninsula Preparatory Academy in Queens, which state Senate President Malcolm Smith helped found. In political news, Democratic Senator Evan Bayh of Indiana has announced he will not seek re-election this year. Bayh's decision hands Republicans another opportunity to win a seat. There's been some speculation he may run for president in 2016. Bayh is the third Democratic senator to announce he's retiring. Senator Chris Dodd of Connecticut and Senator Byron Dorgan of North Dakota previously said they would not seek re-election. Meanwhile, Republican Senator John McCain of Arizona is facing a challenge from the right in the Republican Party. Party. Former Republican congressman and right-wing radio host J.D. Hayworth launched his campaign to challenge Senator John McCain at a rally Monday in Phoenix. Standing next to Hayworth at his campaign launch were Sheriff Joe Arpaio and Chris Simcops, the co-founder of the anti-immigrant Minutemen. And in journalism news, the 2009 George Polk Awards were announced Monday. An award was given to the unnamed people who captured on video the shooting death of Iranian student Nida Aga Sultan during protests of Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's disputed re-election. The curator of the awards, John Darnton, said, quote, this award celebrates the fact that in today's world, a brave bystander with a cell phone camera can use video sharing and social networking sites to deliver news. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In Afghanistan, thousands of U.S. and NATO forces have entered the fourth day of a major offensive in southern Helmand province. The assault, which is billed as an attempt to remove the Taliban from the city of Marja, is one of the largest military offensives of the eight-year war. At least 19 civilians have been killed so far, including six children who died when a missile struck their house on the outskirts of the city. Meanwhile, the Italian NGO, Emergency, says dozens of seriously injured civilians are being prevented from reaching hospitals in the provincial capital, Lashkarga, due to military blockades. Emergency said six victims died because their evacuation was hindered and denounced what it called severe war crimes by Allied forces. While U.S. and NATO troops were reportedly targeted with heavy gunfire, sniper fire and improvised explosive devices today, the military claims most of Marja is under their control. Many members of the Taliban are believed to have fled into Pakistan after the U.S. warned the attack on Marja was imminent. Many residents have also fled to nearby towns. A spokesman for the governor of Helmand said nearly a thousand displaced families had arrived in Lashkarga. We go now to Afghanistan to speak with Wall Street Journal reporter Anand Gopal. He joins us on the line from Kabul. Anand, welcome to Democracy Now! Tell us what's happening. What do you understand has happened in Marja? Well, U.S. forces uh, are pushing very slowly closer to the town center of Marja. Um, taking the town center would be essentially uh, the symbolic victory of the offensive, because that's where uh, the, most of the population lives. And so they've been moving very slowly and encountering uh, increasing resistance as they get to the center. But um, they have taken most of the areas in which they've gone through. And what about this charge of the Italian uh, medical aid group Emergency, who said that residents who were trying to leave were stopped by blockades by U.S. NATO forces, and those, some of those that died, died as a result of not being able to get out? Yeah, we think that these people that the NGO is referring to are uh, one of the 12 people that were killed in a rocket attack uh, a couple of days ago. This is an errant rocket that hit a house, uh, killing everybody inside, including a number of children. Uh, and, and many uh, locals in the area, both in Marja and in other parts of the province, have complained that the military forces haven't let them to move around. The military says that's because uh, insurgents are leaving the area and fleeing to Pakistan, so they've put a almost a complete halt on a lot of the movement there. And what is the response around Afghanistan, in places like where you are right now, in Kabul, to this assault on Marja? 
Well, you know, it's interesting because Marja isn't a particularly strategic uh, place, or it isn't a place that holds any really st uh, strategic value. It's a very tiny town in Helmand province. Um, the official estimate is around 80,000, but I think a lot of Afghans and I also think that's a, a huge overestimate. Um, and so it's m more seen as a show of force by the coalition forces, something they can uh, both of their home audiences and how they've gone into a, a village and, and retaken it from the Taliban. Uh, but beyond that, nothing will really change on the ground, uh, regardless of what happens in Marja. And that, that's sort of what's informing the reaction around the country, where people are um, seeing this more as business as usual and not a real point in the war. Um, uh Anand Gopal, the latest news on the uh, Taliban leader who the U.S. and NATO forces say has been captured, though the Taliban are refusing to uh, admit this, the top military commander, Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar, seized in Karachi, Pakistan, and his significance. Uh, Mullah Brother is uh, the day-to-day -day leader of the Taliban. Uh, Mullah Omar, who's the supreme leader, is in hiding and um, has very little contact with the rest of the movement. So Mullah Brother is the person who's actually in charge of the day-to-day -day activities of the movement. So if it's true that he actually has been captured, that it's pretty significant in that development. He would be the highest-ranking uh, Taliban uh, member ever captured by U.S. Uh, or uh, Pakistani forces. Um, and he's somebody who had a lot of influence over the movement, but he's also somebody who is seen by, in some circles, by some circles as one of the more moderate elements of the Taliban. Um, he is behind uh, a Taliban rule book, for example, that had come out a couple of years ago, which um, asked Taliban fighters to try to limit civilian casualties, for example. So uh, it's an interesting question whether his capture could actually help uh, coalition forces' efforts or, in fact, do the opposite and actually pave the way for an even more extreme leader to come and take his place. And the latest news that we're getting um, of the rocket attack on the house that General McChrystal said, well, he had made a mistake, uh, the military had made a mistake and hit the wrong house that killed, it's believed, half a dozen children and other civilians. Uh, the latest news we have here is uh, that General McChrystal uh, has said that um, uh, he's apologized to Hamid Karzai, and they have said that they will stop the rocket strikes. What do you understand about the killings and this latest uh, edict from above, the stopping of the rockets? The rocket strikes, in this case, for, from a particular uh, missile system that uh, the U.S. forces have there in the region. So they are halting uh, strikes from that uh, missile system. And uh, civilian casualties, of course, is a very sensitive issue. And so um, General McChrystal and the rest of the, the leadership, military leadership here were very sensitive to any, uh, any, any sort of a sense of, from the Afghans that uh, civilians are being killed in the operation. And so they're very quick to apologize in this case. And uh, the President Carter actually put out, very quickly put out a statement denouncing the attack. Um, but the, the difficult thing in understanding uh, what's happening there is that we know at least 12 people were killed, but it's very difficult for reporters to get to Marja. Almost all the reporters who are there are there as embedded reporters, so they're only seeing one side of the story. And we won't know for some time yet if uh, these are the only cases or if there are many more. Anand Gopal, I want to thank you for being with us. Anand Gopal is a Wall Street Journal reporter based in Afghanistan, speaking to us from Kabul. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. Stay with us. Whole pirate, yes, they won't buy. So night to the mission ships. Feeling soft that they took I from the band them lays me. But my hand was made small by the end of the Almighty. We forward in this generation triumphantly. Won't you help to see the sons of freedom who's all have?
Haitian singer T. Rosemond singing here in our studio Bob Marley's Redemption Song. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. It's been five weeks since the magnitude 7.0 earthquake devastated Haiti. The death toll continues to rise. On Monday, four school children were killed when a school collapsed in the northern city of Cape Haitian, reportedly after a night of heavy rains and an aftershock. At least 54 aftershocks have been felt in Haiti since the earthquake last month. Much of the Port-au-Prince remains under mountains of rubble. And Haitian officials say it would take years to clear out the rubble and begin the process of rebuilding the destroyed city. Where landmarks like the National Palace and the cathedral once stood, a new architecture has appeared. Hundreds of tent cities have been set up. And food distribution points dot the city, run primarily by the United Nations with support from U.S. troops. These structures might be temporary, but as pledges of billions of dollars of international aid and investment are made, debates over the vision of a new Haiti are already underway. Well, journalist Avi Lewis was recently in Haiti, exploring the politics of rebuilding the shattered country. He spoke to a number of people, including Haitian presidential adviser Patrick Ely and economist Camille Chalmer. His report aired on the program Fault Lines on Al Jazeera English last week. One month after the earthquake in Haiti, a new normal is taking shape. The symbols of the old order are in ruins. The new landscape already looks like it's always been there. More food is being distributed, though never enough. Markets are open, but prices have spiked, a disaster tax on the informal economy. In the Haitian government and in the conference rooms of foreign powers, the redesign of the country has already begun. What's the vision, and who will benefit from the reconstruction? What kind of future is being planned for this nation of survivors. According to the Haitian official in charge of clearing collapsed buildings, it would take 12 hours a day for an entire year to remove all the rubble in Port-au-Prince, if the country had a fleet of a thousand trucks. The long project of rebuilding Haiti has barely begun. But with billions of dollars of international aid and investment expected, the debate over the vision of a new Haiti is already in full swing. It's time to really say Haiti has a red carpet for foreign investments. Please come in. There must be another model of industrialization, another model of investment, serving the domestic market and the needs of the people. Uh, and Haiti has very low labor costs. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's an opportunity there. The first thing we need to do is spend money on agriculture. The people need food now, not aid. We're talking about money so that we can work the land better. We need to rebuild our state. We need a strong state. And we're not about to accept a coup d'etat. With the Haitian government diminished since the disaster, the UN and the US have taken the lead in relief efforts. Delays in the delivery of aid have received a lot of attention, especially when food distribution goes wrong. But in those places where aid is being delivered successfully, there are principles at work that could guide the larger project of Haiti's reconstruction. Haiti should not be pitied, please, should be helped, not pitied, not looked down upon, but probably looked at for some new lessons in solidarity, in discipline, in resilience. Most of the people made homeless in Port-au-Prince are living in hundreds of ad hoc camps. Many are administered by neighborhood committees that oversee food and water distribution, construction, sanitation and security. Camille Chalmers is an economist with the Haitian Platform for Development Alternatives. 
We've seen almost one and a half million people in the streets who've been able to self-organize in order to respond to the crisis. And they've shared everything they had. They shared their food, they shared their clothes, they shared their blankets. And I think it's a very significant example that must be used in rebuilding, that must be part of the possibility of a different future. This is a parking area of the school, okay, but now it's a house of the people. But the security, we got two in day, two in night, okay, we make a change. If someone is going to come here to give us something, first we organize to get the message out. Once everyone knows that aid is coming and that everyone will get their share, everyone remains orderly because they know that even if they're at the back of the line, they'll still get something. As much as Haitians have been fending for themselves, the need for help from outside is massive. Both the UN mission to Haiti, known as MINUSTA, and the US military, which has been operating the port and the airport, have been under fire for prioritizing security over the quick delivery of aid. Haiti's Prime Minister, Jean-Max Bellerive, told us he worries that the fixation with security could turn into a self-fulfilling prophecy. When I'm in the meeting, this is exactly what I'm trying to convey to my partners, Minister or, or American or Canadians. I understand your point of view, but my point of view is that there's some sort of sense of urgency. Until now, the Asian population is very calm. Don't wait until you have really to react and take care of a security problem. You're going to have friction as you have a high priority need to be met. Uh, we work through that uh, very effectively, and I think the people of Haiti feel the effects that are being delivered. They don't care about the security organization. They just want, they just want the water, the food, the medics get to them. And they don't care, and they don't feel that there is a need of so much security. So they're just asking why all that food, all that water is still at the airport or in the storage facilities. Uh, we are out with the people. Uh, we are living with the people. We are delivering aid to the people. Uh, so um, I, I, don't, I can't speak not, for the not, Prime Minister. You're not saying the Prime Minister's not telling the truth. I'm, I can only say you should judge for yourself what you have seen in Haiti, uh, what I see in Haiti when I go about and, uh, and uh, support our operations here, and that is U.S. forces where they're needed, delivering aid to the people. We accompanied the U.S. Navy on a recent food distribution to the town of Jeremy. With thousands of hungry people waiting, and only a handful of soldiers and U.S. civilians on the ground, it was not exactly a scene of calm. But it was clear that local community leaders were key to getting food in the hands of the people. Minister Bell Reeve says NGOs and foreign governments are having trouble getting it. We are going to keep trying to explain them if you want to have some success, you have to work with the Haitian at every level. While the disaster has sparked generosity and global goodwill, it has also magnified a long standing trend foreign organizations and governments bringing their own priorities and interests to the job of helping Haiti. For decades, all has been done to weaken the Haitian state. And now everybody is screaming bloody murder. The Haitian state is too weak to handle this situation. The state in Haiti used to include major public companies, rice, flour, electricity, telephones. Today, after decades of privatization and pressure from the U.S. and international financial institutions, control of those businesses has moved offshore. Haiti is dependent on expensive imports for food and other essentials. Facing a reconstruction project of epic proportions, the country is poorly positioned to build its own future. Let's take one concrete example. There was a publicly owned cement company that was privatized in 1997. Now decisions are being made by owners of multinationals. 
who are trying to maximize their profits. We have a company from Colombia, we have a company from, from Mexico, uh, and so they are, they are, they, certainly they will provide the, the cement. So cement, we don't produce the, the cement here. What we do is, I mean, we import the clinker and we import, and then we package the cement here. Haiti's cement industry is a story of a failure that will weigh heavily on the process of reconstruction. We're going to have large construction companies which are already uh, contacting us because uh, the investments are going to be huge, so it's going to be attractive for any, any company. Rebuilding Haiti will clearly be big business, business largely led by outsiders. So now the question is whether the country's self-sufficiency could be rebuilt at the same time. And that is a debate about the economic plan for Haiti, one that was already in motion before the earthquake hit. And Haiti had a plan before the earthquake, uh, and it was inching along <laughs> uh, on, on that plan. So uh, they are already focused on how do we come back to that plan, obviously recognizing it will have to be revised because of the devastation. Haiti's poverty reduction strategy is intended to diversify its economy. But the centerpiece is a special relationship with one country and one industry. To spur the creation of jobs, the United States passed the HOPE Act of 2006 to give garments made in Haiti tariff-free access to U.S. markets. Last October, we did extend this trade preference for another decade. Apparel is one of the largest sectors in Haiti's economy, and we see great possibility for job creation in this field. In the wake of the earthquake, the push is on to increase that business fivefold, boosting employment in apparel factories from 25,000 to 150,000. The Hope Law is going to go into 2018. So we have a window of opportunity, and we have to create that opportunity right now. It was, it was needed before, and it's much needed now. What the workers say is altogether different. Lots of workers we talk to say that although they have low wages now, they decided to stop working at the factory because of exploitation, because their individual lives were totally ruined. There was no way to have a family life. And because of the indignation caused by the exploitation of women, High noon, and a crowd has gathered at the site of the Palm Apparel Factory. When the quake hit at 4.53 p.m. on January 12, more than 1,000 people were in this building. According to the factory owner, the only survivors were those who jumped from the third floor. That makes this one of the disaster's deadliest sites. Although it's clear from the smell that there are still bodies in the wreckage, the recovery of corpses is over now. It's T-shirts that are being pulled from the rubble. People begin to scavenge. We've heard from a lot of employees here today that... Um... Shots are fired overhead. The crowd is chased from the site, and the salvage operation gets back to work. We talked to a number of former workers. They claim that practices at the factory may have contributed to the death toll, because they were routinely kept late to meet production quotas. There's a quota. If you don't meet the quota they want, they curse at you, beat you, and pressure you to make that quota or more. So there's a time we have to arrive, but no set time to leave. They always end up staying 20, 30 minutes later, sometimes even 45 minutes. Uh, sometimes you have to tell them, get out, don't stay, go home, go see your family. But it's just that these are poor people, they're making a living, and the job is good for them. This is why they stay and make the extra money. You can't leave because you have a supervisor standing over you. They can fire you. Sometimes the boss stands in front of you to keep you from leaving. They even close the gate. This crisis with the earthquake and the loss of life in the factory illuminate the abominable working conditions in which the working class labors. And there's a whole process of lengthening the workday to make significant profits. So this points the finger at one of the wounds in the dominant model.
and the necessity of having another vision of the economy and of economic growth. Long before the earthquake, factory pay was a hot topic in Haiti. Last year, President René Preval imposed a minimum wage of three U.S. dollars a day, despite pressure from protests and striking workers. That paved the way for a foreign investors conference hosted by U.N. envoy Bill Clinton, and plans for new factories followed. This time around, there is no public discussion of raising wages for factory workers. My son is still under there. We can't do anything about it. He was trapped, and then he suffocated. This time around, most Haitians are in no position to debate the economic model that will shape their future. He spent three days in there. Daybreak in Haiti's central plateau, a fertile land of lakes, mountains, and family farms. The Haiti you never see on TV. Thirty years ago, this country grew almost all the rice it could eat. Then trade policies ripped apart this way of life. Farmers lost their price protections and cheap imports flooded the country. Farming was no longer economically viable for the majority. There's no money, but there's land. Like this land, if you had money, you could get good harvests. But sometimes there's no money to work the land the way you should. And so farmers left the land en masse, went to the city, swelling the slum population of Port-au-Prince, building houses on hillsides, finding work, if any, in the informal economy or factories making clothing for export. My cousin worked in a factory. She led a miserable life. The workers demanded a raise, but the president didn't allow it. After the earthquake, with hunger and homelessness reigning in the city, hundreds of thousands of Haitians are going back to the countryside, reversing the decades-old pattern of migration. As billions of dollars begin to flow into rebuilding Haiti, the question for them is, what kind of future can they hope to find here? We travel up into the mountains, two and a half hours by mule, to visit a summit of peasant organizations gathered to discuss their response to the disaster. If there was something for them to do, all these young people wouldn't have gone to Port-au-Prince and died. They would have stayed here to work. A lot of money has come in for reconstruction. We hear about it, but we have yet to see it. Amazon Girard is the president of the federation hosting this meeting. Farmers are now in a situation where they need to produce much more. Because we have all these people from the capital who lost everything, who are coming back to the countryside. Decentralization hasn't happened yet. We have to decentralize the government's power to the countryside. The people who hit the road and gone back to their original village or region, these are going to have to be offered not only, not a refugee camp, but a new community with the opportunities for work, for creation of wealth that should go with a community. But what kind of work, and how should that wealth be created? Haiti's current plan, backed by international financial institutions, calls for a familiar model of growth through serving foreign markets, tourism, exports of fruit and textiles. But there's an alternative to these grand schemes, one that builds an economy by meeting the needs of local people. It started with free health care. That's what we have been doing for the last 20 years, you know, working closely to this community and to hear their voice and to see how we can work together. And now 
they got access to this healthcare, you know, and they got access to some potable water, and they got access. We try, you know, to help to do some social service like building houses for some of patients. Partners in Health began as a small clinic here in the town of Conge in the 1980s. It was co-founded by Paul Farmer, now deputy UN envoy to Haiti. That clinic is now this full-service hospital, which also has a school and programs in art, music, and job training. Partners in Health now has 10 hospitals, 26 public schools, and a huge network of community workers throughout the country. Partners in Health is many things. We're a clinical system. We do education, food, water, agriculture, a broad community organization. But at the root of it, we're an employment agency. We have over 4,000 employees. 100 of those are Haitian docs. 200 of those are Haitian nurses and nurse auxiliaries. The vast majority are community health workers. Every single one of them is paid at a wage that's respectful. Over time, this health project has grown into a quiet, rural revolution that touches every aspect of life. The latest is a pilot project in agriculture. Rather than just feeding people, it helps them farm. Agronomist Stenio Louis Jeune sees this model as a clear alternative to an economy of factory work in crowded cities. Sure, you can still have subcontracting, but it shouldn't be prioritized. Because Haiti is a rural country, it's essentially agricultural. We have six months of rain a year with which we can perform miracles. And also we have water which is being wasted. We have land lying vacant and we have farm labor. If we exploited all of that, Haiti would be among the wealthiest countries in the world. We can create tens and thousands of jobs for people who will do caregiving, work at the bedside, be the leg for somebody whose legs cut off. If you want to make stimulus and you want to make recovery in Haiti, create jobs. Work from the bottom up. That's what our organization's been able to do. Despite this Made in Haiti success story, bottom-up plans are not high on the reconstruction agenda. Haiti's government and international agencies look at the 450 self-organized refugee camps in Port-au-Prince and see huge challenges in providing food, sanitation and shelter. But these new communities, born of desperation, could also be something else. A source of collective wisdom. A place to hear the voices of the people who want a say in building their country back. In the camps, people are talking a lot about solidarity, fraternity and mutual aid. They are thinking about what economies built on solidarity look like, about how people who don't know each other can live together and organize and resolve basic problems, starting from an exceptional situation that has allowed people to discover that we are all Haitians, that we share elements of the same culture, and on that basis we can recreate life and take new paths. Even though I'm not a believer in any religion, but I know that Every religion believes in the notion of sacrifice. People are to die for people to live. And our dead died for us to live. We have to feed off their spirit, understand their message, understand that they could no longer live in this environment and in these circumstances and these conditions. And they died so that we could pick up that strong message. Haitian presidential advisor Patrick A. Lee in that report on Al Jazeera English from Al Avi Lewis, produced by Andrew Schmidt. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a minute. Senator Schmidt! Half of official Washington is here to see democracy's finest show of filibuster, the right to talk your head off, the American privilege of free speech in its most dramatic form. So I've got a few things I want to say to this party. I tried to say them once before, and I got stopped colder in a mackerel. Well, I'd like to get them said this time, sir. And as a matter of fact, I'm not going to leave this body until I do get them said. President, will the senator yield? The senator yield? No, sir, I'm afraid not. Now, you're not going to have a country that can make these kind of rules work if you haven't got men that have learned to tell human rights from a punch in the nose. Get up off the ground. That's all I ask. Get up there with that lady. 
that's up on top of this Capitol Dome, that lady that stands for liberty. Take a look at this country through her eyes if you really want to see something. And you won't just see scenery. You'll see the whole parade of what man's carved out for himself after centuries of fighting. And fighting for something better than just jungle law. Fighting so he can stand on his own two feet, free and decent, like he was created. No matter what his race, color, or Clips creed. of Jimmy Stewart in the Frank Capra classic, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. On Monday, Indiana Senator Evan Bayh announced his decision to not seek re-election, saying, quote, Congress is not operating as it should. Well, some other Senate Democrats think one of the main problems with the way Congress is operating is the Senate's abuse of the filibuster, the tactic of delaying and blocking floor votes. Senate Republicans are currently using the filibuster to paralyze the Senate and derail Democratic initiatives, according to a McClatchy newspaper's investigation. Since President Obama took office, Republican senators have used the filibuster to stall legislation on health care reform, global warming and financial regulation, and the confirmation of 15 Obama nominees. Last week, Senators Gene Shaheen and Tom Harkin introduced a bill aimed at curtailing the filibuster. Their proposal would gradually reduce the number of votes required to overcome a filibuster, so a simple majority of 51 votes could eventually end the debate. But Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid dismissed their efforts, noting changing the rule would require 67 votes. Appearing on CBS's Face the Nation with Bob Schieffer, first Sunday, Vice President Joe Biden described the Senate's abuse of the filibuster as the worst he's ever seen. Most people would agree that the United States Senate has never acted as consistently as they have to require a supermajority, that is, 60 votes, to get anything done. That's a fundamental shift. I was there for 36 years. I don't ever recall it being abused and used as much as it has now. Well, my next guest, Chicago-based lawyer Thomas Gagan, has been a vocal advocate of ending the filibuster. In a recent op-ed in The New York Times and an editorial in The Nation magazine, Gagan describes Senate Republicans' use of ghost or procedural filibusters as unconstitutional. He warns it's silence debate and will jeopardize the Obama presidency. Thomas Gagan is the author of C in court, how the right made America a lawsuit nation. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Thomas Gagan. Um, lay out how the filibuster works today, why we hear so much more about, well, can we get 60 votes than we did when the Republicans are in power, who seem to be much more concerned about getting 51. Well, Amy, the modern procedural filibuster, or ghost filibuster, or filibuster without filibustering, began in 1975, when the old talking filibuster rule was changed to allow the Senate to uh, 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 put a cloture on debate with 60 instead of 67 votes. But uh, what happened was that the practice of having senators filibuster just lapsed. The majority leaders of the Senate, especially the Democratic majority leaders, let the minority pretend or threaten a filibuster, and then everyone operated on the basis that there was a pretend filibuster going on, and the question then became whether you could cut off this filibuster where there's no Jimmy Stewart out there filibustering it. That was the big change, and that's why it's gone from a practice of four or five a congressional term to something like 130 a congressional term. Can you explain, Thomas Gagan, the history of the filibuster? Uh, well, it's a tangled history. Uh, there was no filibuster when the founders put the Constitution in place in 1787. And when the first vice president sat uh, as the presiding officer of the Senate, a man who happened to be Thomas Jefferson, and wrote a manual of Senate procedure, a simple majority could cut off debate. But Aaron Burr, remember Aaron Burr, who shot Alexander Hamilton? Well, he allowed unlimited debate. There was no rule for cutting off debate, but the rule wasn't abused in any serious way until uh, the early 20th century, when in 1917 there was a rule put in to uh, put a cloture or end unlimited debate, two-thirds rule. This was in 1917. But again, a talking filibuster was rarely used in the Senate. The Senate term could only accommodate three or four of these at the most, because you effectively had to, like in the Jimmy Stewart movie, shut down the whole government. So these were very rare and infrequent, and mainly used by Southern senators on Jim Crow laws and so forth. They were embarrassing to the Senate. Uh, look at the Jimmy Stewart movie. It was an embarrassment. So they 
change the rule to try to get rid of filibusters altogether. But at the time they changed the rule in 1975 to get rid of filibusters altogether, the Senate majority leaders, for some reason, just began as a gentlemanly, quote unquote, sort of thing to let the uh, debate be a pretend debate so that no one would be embarrassed. And that made it much easier for the minority to use. And that's why it's gone up from something that was a rare, paralyzing, shut down the government event once in a while to something that is used routinely now on every, on, on every contested bill. Thomas Gagan, what And it's turned the Senate into a supermajority. Explain the supermajority. Yes. Well, the supermajority, uh, this Constitution is set up for majority rule in both houses of Congress. There are enough checks and balances on majority rule that you don't need a supermajority, except in certain cases where the founders in the Federalist Papers, and I mean Madison and Hamilton, with obvious guilt, explain why on a treaty or on uh, expulsion of a member of Congress, you have to have a supermajority, a two-thirds vote. But there's no 60-vote rule anywhere in the Constitution. And the, in, in Federalist Number 75, if anyone wants to look up their Federalist Papers and in other uh, essays in the Federalist Papers, uh, Hamilton, Madison explaining the Constitution say that supermajorities would paralyze the operation of the government. So the Constitution has only specific occasions where a supermajority can be used. And it specifically says that the vice president of the United States, his presiding officer, is the tiebreaker of the Senate quote, when the Senate is equally divided, unquote. That means 50-50. So 50 plus one vice president is the majority rule under which the Senate is supposed to operate according to the Constitution. And today, it is 60 votes because it takes 60 votes, 60 senators, to cut off a pretend filibuster where nobody is really filibustering and effectively to enact the bill into law. A complete violation of the Constitution. Thomas Gagan. And, yes, Amy, go ahead. There's another provision that violates. Um, if you look at Article 1, Section 5, those of you who have their constitutions out, you'll see a rule that the founders were very proud of. It's a rule that says a majority of legislators constitute a quorum. Normally, it's two thirds. But the founders were so frightened that there'd be supermajority rule in either the House or the Senate, that they put in this special procedural rule, which says only a, a majority is enough to constitute a quorum and enact a bill. Why is that? It's not just because it was a long time to get the stagecoach by Washington and people might not show up. It's because the founders were afraid that a minority under a two-thirds rule could just walk out of the House or the Senate and block the uh, enactment of a bill, the appointment of a presidential nominee, in other words, to do exactly what's going on right now through the use of the procedural or, or pretend filibuster. So this is all blatantly unconstitutional. Hmm. Um, what about those who argue that it's the filibuster that saved the country from Bush? Well, it didn't. And one of the things that the filibuster did is it delivered the country to Bush. You know, if, if the filibuster has been used over and over to frustrate, uh, well, I'm a labor lawyer, Amy, so uh, three times there's been uh, a, a frustration of the filibuster. It's passed the Senate by a majority, but not a supermajority, so we don't have labor law reform. We don't have unions. We don't, we have more inequality. People don't have pensions. And, you know, my friends go around and talk about, oh, globalization, globalization. I want to say to them, it's Senate Rule 22. You know, if, if it is the filibuster that frustrated the Carter agenda, that frustrated the progressive side of the Clinton agenda, that delegitimates the Democratic Party, people look at Barack Obama right now and say, well, he can't get anything done. We're frustrated with him. We'll vote in the Republicans. It is the filibuster that keeps delivering the country to the Republicans because the Democrats, thanks to the filibuster, are unable to govern. That's the, the horror of the thing. And, and the worst part is to have progressives turn around and say, now that the country is back in the hands of the Republicans, thanks to the filibuster, which has blocked labor law reform and health care and everything else, isn't it a good thing we have the filibuster because now we can stop Bush? I mean, it makes no sense. Uh, this is a horrible thing 
for progressives. The Senate exists, uh, thanks to the filibuster, historically for two things. One was originally to protect slavery, and the second is to protect kind of low-wage labor. That's its basic function, and it is the main reason that we have this great inequality in the country today. We don't have one person, one vote in our country. We have this Senate rule where two senators from a state with 600,000 are equal to uh, California with 36 million. It's not small states versus uh, big states. It gives the conservative states an enormous veto over everything that could occur when a progressive majority takes over the presidency and the Congress. What about the idea that it protects the minority party? Well, it doesn't protect the minority party. In some ways, I think it tears apart the uh, minority party. Look at the Tea Party right now and the Republicans. You know, when you have majority rule, what does that mean? It means that the minority party has to compromise. It has to govern with the progressives because they can't stop them. If you have a situation in which you've got the Weimar Republic brought back again, you know, you can completely polarize and shut down the administration. Um, it, 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 pulls, it, it pulls apart um, uh, the opposition and pushes it, in my view, further and further to the left, uh, further to the right, I mean. You know, it just uh, uh, it, it, it puts the Republican Party in the hands of the extremists because they know they can shut down the government, discredit Barack Obama. They've seen how the filibuster worked with uh, Carter discredited him, saw how it worked in the Clinton administration the first two years when the Democrats had a majority, discredited him. They know they can bring down the government this way. And when you give the power to a minority to bring down the government, it's going to be exercised irresponsibly. We used to have in this country in the 1940s and 1950s, you know, uh, uh, some kooks on the Republican side, but fairly responsible opposition party you know, in a certain way. Uh, there was a lot of bipartisanship, especially on foreign policy. But, you know, you even had Robert Taft uh, proposing federal housing programs for people. It, it was um, a, a party that had to find its way to the center because there was a center left that was able to govern. We only that have a can't minute. Happen, we only have a minute to go, Thomas Gagan. But what worse. do you think uh, they should do in Congress right now, and what do you think Harry Reid should do? I think that we should let the filibuster be the filibuster. Um, if we can't get rid of it through court or have the vice president declare it unconstitutional as presiding officer, which Joe Biden should do, uh, let the filibuster be the filibuster. If they want to obstruct, let them obstruct. Bring up the minor appointees and let them shut down the Senate. Uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Let people see how ridiculous this is. Let's go back and have the replays of the Jimmy Stewart movies. And I think the country will be disgusted. The procedural filibuster uh, will be gone. The old talking filibuster will be back. It will be discredited and we'll move on and begin governing the country again. Do you think the Democrats rely on the threat of the Republican filibuster because they don't want to move forward on the kinds of issues you're concerned about? Well, some do, but I think the majority, uh, really, for ego and vanity reasons, love the filibuster. You know, there are all sorts of progressive senators on the left who love it. And the reason is, it gives one senator enormous power to put a procedural hold on an appointee. And I have to say, there is no better way to raise money for a senator than to go around to contributors and saying, hey, I single-handedly can shut down the whole country, which, as the rules now operate, they can do. So, people, it's a lot easier to buy one or two senators to put procedural holds on things than to buy 50 senators to block the whole nominee. You know, it, it's a very insidious Five system. Seconds. It's extremely corrupting. Thomas Gagan, I want to thank you for being well, with us as a lawyer based in Chicago, author of See in Court, How the Right Made America a Lawsuit Nation. And that does it for the show. Democracy Now! produced by Mike Berkshire, Huda Kadusa, Armata, Angela Comet, Steve Martinez, Nicole Salazar, Honey Masood, Robbie Karen. Special thanks to Becca Gale, uh, Becca Staley, I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.